Okay, the article we decided to do was the morphometrical variation of the carpal bones in thoroughbreds and ponies. Now, the purpose of the study was to identify the morphological and morphometrical variations and similarities in the carpal bones in the thoroughbreds and the ponies. Now, the morphometrical is more of the quantitative vari or values that deals with more of the number aspects of the bones, while the morphological deals with the shape and the structure aspects of the bones. Now, why would we do this is because uh, there was little data on this subject and it appealed to the researchers. Now, in all horses, there are seven carpal bones, but there's two that can, that can potentially be there, and those are the first and the fifth carpal bones. Now, in the 1995 article, The Function of the Equine Carpal Bone, a review by Dean and Davies, the joint, it states that the joint is elastic. There's, the compression stress is absorbed by the intercarpal ligaments and overextension is prevented by the stop losses of the carpal bones. Now a little bit of background on thoroughbreds is that their main function is horse racing. They're bred to run fast. This has resulted in horse health issues that as they pursued, as they pursued to build a lighter horse, uh, this has resulted in a lot of fractures. Um, about two thoroughbreds will die every day and that's about 1.5 out of 100 starts of horses will end up fracturing and dying. Now, a little bit of background about the ponies is that their main function is, deals with weight bearing, such as driving and being a child's mount. This has led, led to stout and sturdier and stouter bodies. Uh, the researchers' hot hypothesis is that the bone structure between the thoroughbred and the pony will vary with their differences in function. Methods included um, collecting the carpus of 23 horses, 10 thoroughbreds, and 10 ponies. The breed, thoroughbreds versus ponies, was recorded as was the age and gender of each horse. Um, in the collection of the samples, one thoroughbred was excluded because the carpus was sectioned during processing. The age of the horses ranged from a year and a half to 23 years. For the thoroughbreds, the average age was 7.3 years, plus or minus 8 years. For the ponies, the mean at age was 3.8 years, plus or minus 5.2 years. Um, the racing history and weight of each horse was excluded, and each carpus went through a post-mortem examination where if any obvious carpal pathology was observed, that sample was excluded. Uh, this is a picture of the equine carpus. Uh, this study was done um, on the proximal row, which is the upper row, and the distal row, which is the bottom row, and concerned um, um, with the proximal row medially to laterally, the radial car carpal bone, the intermediate carpal bone, the ulnar carpal bone, and the accessory carpal bone, which you can't see on that picture. Uh, it also concerned the distal row, which is the bottom row, and from medially to laterally, so inner to outer of the leg, uh, included the first carpal bone, which um, is not on this one. It, the first and fifth carpal bones on horses is inconsistent. And the, uh, so on this picture, the second carpal bone is obvious, the third carpal bone and the fourth carpal bone. The proximal row articulates with the radius and the distal row articulates with the metal carpal bones seen here as MC4, MC3, and MC2. Um, they articulate through the carpal metacarpal joint. The bone preparation uh, included keeping the right and left carpus separate throughout processing and measurement and morphological uh, examination. Um, the bones were all boiled at 98.5 degrees Celsius for 48 hours, despite the fact that the bones of younger horses took less time, all bones were boiled for the same length of time. Um, they were boiled to detach the soft tissue from the uh, carpal bones, and they were examined for the inconsistent first and fifth carpal bones. 
They were then air dried for 24 hours and heated at 48.5 degrees for 8 hours to dry them. This established a constant dry weight. Um, morphologically, a description was included of variations between and within the groups of each carpal bone. This included the shape of the articular faucets, the extent of the articular faucets, and the faucets themselves, tubercles, and fossa. For the first carpal bone, uh, it was limited to the description of shape of the bone and what the first carpal bone articulated with the adjacent bones. The morphometric, morphometric uh, examination included calculation of the bone volume, relative density of the bones, and linear measurements. The uh, bone volume was calculated using displacement in water at 27 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature. The bone was lowered into a beaker of water um, attached by to a thin, fine thread, and the weight of the beaker without the bone was recorded, and the weight with the bone was, also, was then also recorded. The difference between the two weights was calculated and was equal to the bone volume. The volumes of each carpal bone were summed and equaled the total volume of the carpus again. The volume of each carpal bone was expressed as a percent of the total volume of the carpus to normalize the comparison between different sized carpi. Uh, then the relative density of the bones was calculated using the constant dry weight, which was previously established in processing um, the volume of the carpal bones which was we just talked about and was determined previously, and then multiplied by the density of the water at 27 degrees Celsius room temperature. Uh, the linear measurements included the width uh, measured lateral medially, the depth measured dorsal pommelly, and the height measured proximo distally. Um, the articular faucets were also measured. Uh, this is a picture from the article of the proximal row, so the radial, intermediate, ulnar, and access accessory bones. Uh, the width was the pros proximal aspects of the radial bone and the intermediate bone uh, as the maximum width lateral medially of the dorsal half of the proximal articular surface. For uh, three and four, the ulnar and accessory bones, it was the distal aspect of the bone for the ulnar and the proximal aspect um, measured as the width on the dorsal pulmonary surface for the accessory. For the depth, uh, for um, the radial bone, it was the lateral aspect. For the intermediate, it was the distal. For the, later, for the ulnar, it was the lateral. And for the accessory, it was the medial. For the height, of the radial bone, it was measured as the dorsal aspect as it was for the intermediate. For the ulnar and accessory, it was the lateral aspect. For the distal row of linear measurements, uh, including width, depth, and height again, for the second, third, and fourth carpal bones, uh, it was measured as the dorsal aspect of all three bones, uh, measured on the proximal surface of the bone for the second, third, and fourth carpal bones. For the depth, um, for the second carpal bone, it was measured on the medial aspect. For the third carpal bone, it was the proximal aspect. And for the fourth carpal bone, it was also the medial, as it was for the second carpal bone. For the height of the distal row, for the second, third, and fourth carpal bones, it was the medial aspect of the second, uh, the dorsal aspect for the third and the fourth. Um, the linear measurements were normalized using the height of the radial carpal bone and plus the height of the third carpal bone as a factor. Um, so this was any measurement of the carpal bones that was taken and then uh, it was normalized using the height of the radial carpal and the height of the third carpal bone which gave a normalized measurement so not affected by 
the breed of the horse, thoroughbred versus pony, for the width, depth, and height of the bones. For the morphometric description of the articular faucets, for the distal articular faucet of the ulnar carpal bone, which is this picture, um, it was the maximum dorsal formal extent of the concave faucet and the maximum dorsal formal depth of the convex faucet. And the, there was a ratio calculated using the concave to the convex. These measurements were made with a ruler graduated in millimeters. For the proximal articular faucet of the third carpal bone, the maximum lateral medial width of the radial faucet and the maximum lateral medial width of the intermediate faucet were uh, measured and a ratio was determined between the radial and the intermediate. For the proximal articular faucets of the fourth carpal bone, uh, it was the maximum lateral palmar extent of the lateral faucet and the maximum dorsal lateral extent of the medial faucet. And also a ratio was made between the former and the latter faucets, the lateral and the medial. Statistical tests were used to quantify these, including the Shapiro-Wilk test, which is a test that looks at the assumption that the sample came from a normally distributed group. We don't know if our thoroughbreds were all the same as any as the rest of the thoroughbreds in, say, the rest of the world. These samples came from horses in Australia. Maybe Australia's thoroughbreds are different uh, than the rest of the world. Um, there was a two-sample t-test used to compare between tests, a paired t-test used to compare the left and right limbs within groups of bones. Um, Two-tailed p-values of less than five hundredths was considered to be statistically different. And that is the method. This study revealed that uh, many of the carpal bones were very similar um, within the groups. However, there are differences between the left and the right carpal bones between the thoroughbreds and the ponies. Um, generally, the right values are larger than the left values, um, and the bones with the most variable were the radial and the third carpal bone, and the ones that were the most similar were the ulnar and the second carpal bones. Uh, this table shows the lateral medial width, the dorsal palmar, and the proximal distal height values with their standard deviations for each of the carpal bones and the right and left side of each one. Uh, where you see a plus, like here, um, it shows the significant differences between the right and the left uh, values. And then where you see a star, like here, um, is the significant differences between the thoroughbreds and the pony values. Um, other morphological results were that the, um, the proximal part of the lateral surface of the radial carpal had a small fossa in 90% of the thoroughbreds and in 46% of the ponies. Um, and then this picture shown here shows the tuberosity that could be seen on the palmar region of the proximal articular surface of the intermediate carpal bone. It was more prominent in the thoroughbreds, however, it was also seen in the ponies, but it was much smaller. Um, this picture shows uh, the palmar tubercle of the ulnar carpal bone that was very distinct in the thoroughbreds. As you can see, the large uh, bone on the bottom of the picture and was really small or almost not seen at all in the ponies, which are shown by the two smaller bones above the larger one. Uh, another thing that we looked at was the fifth carpals. Uh, there were, they were not seen in any of our subjects but the first carpal, which they were also looking for, uh, was, seen, was present in all the ponies bilaterally and only in three of the thoroughbreds, but however, it wasn't bilateral in the thoroughbreds. And that's our results. Uh, 
Uh, next, we're going to talk about our discussion, and it's basically going to be general findings, why they think these findings occurred, and potential research that could um, help support these findings. And a lot of the potential research is, you know, studying more with more samples, more breeds, and just comparing the results with this study to future studies. So the first general finding that was found in this research was the morphometrical differences between the breeds. And the first difference that they found was the presence of the tuberosity on the proximal aspect of the intermediate carpal bone. And it was found in all of the thoroughbreds, but only two of the ponies. Uh, reasoning that they had of why they think it was present in all of the thoroughbreds was that it was to help stabilize the carpus from transverse movements. The next difference that they found was the ratio of the radial facet to the intermediate facet of the larger of the third carpal bone and it was found to be larger in the thoroughbreds. The, their reasoning was that the third carpal bone takes more of an axial, axial loading from the radial carpal bone and the in the thoroughbreds. The next was the ratio of the width of the lateral facet to the medial facet of the fourth carpal bone, which was found to be larger in the ponies. There was no reasoning given during the experiment as to why they think that way. Uh, further tests that could be done for the, this result is to figure out the functions of the facets of that bone. The next result was the extension on the palmar surface of the articular surface of the second carpal bone. And it was found only in, pon in the ponies and their hypothesis was that this extension would restrict the range of flexion of the carpus. And they believe that the thoroughbreds would have a larger range of flexion due to absence of this extension. A possible experiment follow-up for this result was to test the range of flexion in different carpi of the horses and to see whether that corresponded with a larger range of flexion as opposed to lesser. The last finding was <coughs> the presence of the first carpal bone and they reference the two previous studies, Getty in 1975, who found that 50% of their samples ha had the first carpal bone, and Butler in 2000 stated that one third of their horses had the first carpal bone. The current study found that one quarter of the horses had the first carpal bone. No hypothesis was given as to why they believe that there's different data over a period of time or the overall function of the first carpal bone. When the first carpal bone was present, it was found more predominantly in the ponies and no hypothesis was given as to why. The next general finding that was found was that there were different normalized values between the two groups, so between the thoroughbreds and the ponies, and this was pretty much due to a variation in the body size and different types of activity done between the thoroughbreds and ponies, so with thoroughbreds it was more racing and ponies it was more weight bearing. And so some examples of this was um, exercise in thoroughbreds caused changes in the dorsal palmar and lateral medial diameter and differences in the height of the withers actually correlated to different heights within the C4 and the C3 bones, carpal bones. And again, further research to help support this would be to sample more horses and measure their carpal bones, um, their height and their width, and standardize them to a normal value and compare them to this study. The next general finding was the difference in heights of the carpal bones, and the only carpal bones that actually had difference in heights was the radial carpal bone and the third carpal bone. A hypothesis for this was that be, that it could be important because of these two bones being the most damaged bones in the carpus of the horse. However, 
the radial carpal bone was found to be taller in the thoroughbreds, while the third carpal bone was found to be taller in the ponies. No hypothesis was given as to why they weren't both bigger in one breed over the other. Okay, uh, another general finding was that there were a few significant variations between the carpal bones of the left and right limbs within the two groups, but of all the significant variations showed the larger bones are, were on the right um, versus the left, especially in the thoroughbreds. So again, this is due to varying susceptibility between the right and left limbs in some pathological conditions. So for example, there is a study done in 1986 by S.E. Palmer on the prevalence of carpal fractures in thoroughbred racehorses, and it showed that fractures were more common in the right carpus than the left, but there was actually a lack of significant variation of the dimensions of the fractured bones, um, suggesting that normal anatomical um, or anatomy itself is not enough to explain Palmer's results. And another um, reason for why there might be larger right bones than left is due to the effect of racing direction in thoroughbreds. So counterclockwise racing produces a higher incidence of right mediocarpal fractures. And so basically the effect of loading in relation to racing direction seemed to be the most um, uh, explanational reason for the variations in the incidence of fractures between the two sides. So further research would be to compare the measurements of the left and right limbs with horses that race in counterclockwise versus clockwise direction. The last general finding was the increased bone density in, of the ponies. The birth from 1999 in a study stated that exercise increased the bone density of the carpus and the horse's bones. So the researchers said that if Firth was right, then that would mean that the ponies were more physically active than the thoroughbreds. The researchers discounted this, saying that the thoroughbreds were race, race horses and they were in better shape than the ponies. So their hypothesis for why ponies had a larger bone density was that the ponies' carpus took on a larger proportional loading as opposed to the thoroughbreds. They supported their claim with Osterlink's study in 1991, which stated that the ponies' forelimbs withstood a uh, force 130% of the ponies' body weight. And also, Dow, who was also in 1991, stated that thoroughbreds' carpus withstood a force of 108% of their body weight. No, st no study has actually been done using live weights, so a possible follow-up would be to use live weights to confirm Osterlinks and Dow's experiment. And the final general finding in this discussion was that bone volume was greater in ponies than in thoroughbreds, and this was specifically found in the left and right ulnar bone and the right and left fourth carpal bones, um, and it showed that they are greater in thoroughbreds. And a reason for this would be the distribution of load bait wearing on carpal bones. Um, they were greater loading on the medial side of the right front limb and the lateral side of the left front limb in horses that race in a counterclockwise direction. And in ponies, the intermediate facet uh, received a greater proportion of the axial loading through the intermediate carpal bones. So. Uh, further research for this would be to distribute different weight loads on the animals and see how that affects the volume of the carpal bone present in the horses. And this is our work cited page.